What I thought was fascinating is that you don't have any path that you were following. That you were actually, I would guess though, because I know you did a lot of reading, so, and you must have been influenced by the books that you were reading, and you read a lot of spiritual books. Mm -hmm. But your own path was really your own path. It wasn't like you were doing the Course in Miracles ideas or the Buddhist thinking. You were really living from your own soul, let's say. Well, you know, the bottom line is th there's nothing any of us can do but that. I mean, so we take our theories to reality and what happens when they don't work? Well, they but don't... we don't because, I mean, I know, well, but see, I know, like myself, I can see when I think back on my life, there were times when I went into my life with these principles and because I knew them intellectually, I thought I was living them, but it was only intellectual. But you were, if you, maybe this is what an artist does, that you had the awareness that you wanted to be authentic. You wanted to be, you wanted it to be, you had more of a perception, Jerry, for it to be real. Does that make sense? You know what I'm trying to say to you? Yes, I do, but it's like, I think pain is a pretty good indicator of what works and what doesn't work. And I couldn't hmm. stand the pain of fooling myself, you might say. And I didn't find anything that worked except what was. And I didn't ask for you know many of these situations that I wrote about, but when I was in them, I trusted them simply because they came. You know, I had no distractions. Giving up everything, all I was was present to what was. So if somebody showed up, that's what I was with. And, and that was God of, of that moment. And so I knew within that simplicity, everything I needed was in there. I didn't always know how I was going to get to it. And I never knew how I was going to get to it. But I knew it was there. More than that, I did not have. That difficult discipline, and that difficult way of trying to maintain that attention has become a dance. You know, it's the celebratory end of it where I feel like mm. I'm doing it in my life now and it's a, it's a much, you know, it's like a habit. We're just in the habit of being afraid of right. life. That's right. really all it is. Well, but I mean, the thing is, uh, when you really look at the existential reality of life, each of us, it does take a bit of courage it and, does, for all of us. Yes, to really confront or to be real um, with what's so. Um, let's jump ahead a bit, because I mean, some of the, there's a lot of synchronicity in your life that uh, really amazing things happened. Let's jump into you now being in uh, uh, Whidbey, and let's tell them how that painting got to the dump. I thought that was a wonderful story. I mean, that really shows that there really is an intelligence that's operating. Mm. Well, I, a friend, um, I did the painting back at, a, at an organization working with um, troubled teens. And so we did started doing this painting together and the kids eventually bowed out. And so it was a painting that with of a lot of those kids and some of their dramas and what was going on. It was at this very liberal camp that, you know, allowed these kids to a little more space than most camps allow. So and you know because the the painting ended up they it was was also with a uh, an, with an organization that the the main organization was a little more conservative and they didn't necessarily like the painting mm -hmm. so uh, they didn't want it so I, I gave it to someone who ended up visiting me here on Whidbey Island or, or on Whidbey Island when I moved to Whidbey and so he brought all of his stuff with him when he moved and he had this painting and then his life was coming undone and he d got rid of a lot of stuff and so he ended up this painting ended up at the dump and they fished mm. it out of the garbage, and <laughs> so they hung it up in this sort of recycle bin. And and I know many people have offered to buy it from them, and they won't, they wouldn't sell it. And so then, when the film was being made um, by Phil Lucas and Mark Sedan, they came and filmed it. And so I told the story a little bit, and and it's still there. It still there. And they won't sell it. People are still trying to buy it. Your current mm. artwork is just mm. uh, astounding. Oh, thank you. But do you sell your current artwork or not? I, I wasn't clear about that. You know, I don't. I, it's one of those pieces that haven't, 
hasn't fallen into place yet. You know, it's like I, 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 it's not a philosophy why I don't. It's just that I haven't felt the rightness of it yet. And because of the, the attention I've been getting with the film and the book, people are offering me sometimes thousands of dollars for my art. I just haven't felt it's time to do that. Or if, I don't know if I even will. I'm just, it's like any, I mean, like I didn't know I would ever be married again or, or married I've, for the first time. But it was one of those things that when it happens, it happens and I know it. I'm trusting it the way I've trusted everything, mm. the way my life has unfolded. And it's one of those pieces that huh. just hasn't fallen into place yet. So I mean, so you don't want other people to have your art or what is it? It's, not, it's none of that. It's more like feeling the rightness of the moment where I, I, that says yes, you know? This is what needs to happen to this. I give stuff away, you know? Hmm. It's just haven't felt the rightness of it. And it's made a kind of sense because when the book was done, all the work was there to photograph. Mm. Yes, I mean, and, and the book has great photographs of your work. So, and that's what I'm trusting, you know, I'm Welcome trusting up the, on the larger. Screen, again, the, there's that. Yeah, I mean, it's the personal, the larger personal mythos as it unfolds. We don't, if I'm out there hustling art for whatever reason, uh -huh. because I think I need money or whatever other reason, I don't know what the larger plan is. And so it makes sense huh. to have it sometimes. Well, well, how do you make your money then? <laughs> well, <laughs> I still don't really make money. I mean, one of the things I was, a, a New York... Um, think tank hired me to write about anything I want because they liked my point of view. I helped um, some of the people involved and they liked what I had to say. So they hired me to write monthly articles for them that on anything I want on the spirit of the time. So I get to, I'm sort of the fringe voice of the artist. It's, well, you see, I can see my mind. You know, my mind is like the world's mind. Well, Jerry, how are you supporting yourself? You know, thinking you have to have an, a a sixty dollar a week or something. And what you're what you you are an example of is trusting that the universe will provide. Yeah, and it's gotten bigger than ever. I mean, a lot. Of, you know, I was. I mean, I figured it out one year. I got, you know, $50,000 came in by way of when we were making the film, friends paid for the film, grants, you know, grants through Parabola, just several things all came in at once. It's like, I just think mm. my life is complicated now, but it seems like the demands are being met by a larger, you know, by some larger force of, of generosity. Right. Well, I want, I, I, uh, there's so many things. We, we don't have much time left, and I want to get to certain things. What's fascinating is that you come from a family. Uh, your grandfather was a, um, a machinist, mm -hmm. right? Would you call him a machinist? Yeah, inventor, machinist. They, would, they were doing way back, yeah, um, you know, for way, during the, like, industrial revolution starting you know, helping industry with their mechanical devices and inventing things for that. And isn't it interesting that your, your, your new art, let's call it your new mm -hmm. art, a lot of it is sculpture and a lot of it is to do with mechanical devices, that you, yeah. you, you pick that up <laughs> from your family. I mean, your, your yeah. artwork is really, you know, you touch things and things yeah. open up and we'll, 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 we'll come up on the screen with some of them. <laughs> Were you, you because your first artwork you didn't do that, did you, Jerry, or maybe you did? No, I it was mostly paintings, which are also in the book. I was just painting earlier on, and now, and it's interesting too. I mean, I didn't plan this, but I see it in retrospect that you know these these piece, art pieces I'm doing are very coffin-like. They're literally the shape of coffin. They're six to eight feet tall. And they all have carved beings inside, or and they and they have all secret compartments and do all ridiculous things. But the first initial hit when you see them all, especially in a line, is that they're very death-like. They have faces on the outside. They look like Egyptian, like Egyptian sarcophaguses. And so, and just like I think what we like a lot of what we've been talking about, you face your fear, and there are gifts there. Similarly, these death-like things, once you actually engage them, they're whimsical and they do ridiculous things and some of them dispense gifts. And I think 
it's such a good kind of metaphor for the journey. Like you walk into these t this terrifying territory, and what you find is is something beautiful in there.